So the first thing is to make sure that the character or your head is going to be realistic real world scale when it comes to subsurface scattering. So we're looking at 23.9 um, centimeters for a head height of an average woman. If you've got a head like this which is on the shoulders then you mustn't take the whole area as 23.9 it's just the head from the chin to the top of the head. So what you would do is you would create yourself a cube, scale that cube to the um, height of the chin to the top of the um, peak of the skull, um, just estimates and then you should give you an idea of exactly whether you're in scale or not. So that's what I do. I'm using redshift and for the redshift area light I'm making sure that the light is small enough that it's going to create reasonably um, hard edged shadows. Not crazy hard edged but hard edged enough that you'll be able to see a slight red tint um, on the outskirts of the shadow and this definitely helps set up your subsurface scattering so I'll go for something quite small in fact you can go very small with this so with a key light it's normally above and to the left or to the right it should create a shadow going across from one area to the next now I'm going to copy this light holding down the control key and do it to the opposite direction the back right in this particular case and this is going to be for our rim for our rim light it can be a bigger light and um, actually quite powerful as well the idea of the rim light is to break the object up from a backdrop especially if it's going to be something like a, a black backdrop you don't want the subject to disappear on the edges under those circumstances so we want to get a nice light here which is showing a little bit of light on the shoulders and just on the outskirt rims hence why it's called a rim light so this would be something that we're after and uh, bring it down a little bit that's A bit more what we're after now in redshift version 3 I'm not sure what version of the version 3 there's a, like a three point something um, unfortunately there's no about on here for me to tell you but um, anyway you've got this IPR and one of the recent builds and what you can do with this redshift IPR is preview in the viewport which is really handy to be able to have. I'm going to make sure I call one rim and then you just use the down arrow and it goes to the next object. You can call this key. At the very bare basics I would have a rim and a key and I would normally set one up at the time so that I know what one is what is doing what to contribute. Now in order for me to set this up I need to at least add a material to the object so I'm going to create a normal redshift material, urban material and drag and drop that on there. By default I don't know why but the material is always set up to have um, a very low roughness, in fact the roughness is zero and this means it's a very reflective surface. We want 0.5 roughly 0.5 for a roughness you can set this up with a map but generally 0.5 is a good basis to start also we want the color for this reflection to have a slight tint of blue in it for human skin and that for the most part is all we need to do at the moment um, we're going to stick with a diffuse 50% gray to start with and then this will be um, enough for us to set our reflections up just initially anyway so we've got this rim in place you can clearly see now because we've added that rim we've now got a bit of a reflection going in there no subsurface scattering at all and um, after viewing this like this I can see that I may need to just bring down that blue tint a little bit it's a little bit too hard so we'll just bring that down a little bit only needs to have a slight hue of blue in there. I think that should do us. Um, I've got two monitors so I can 
easily go between the monitors so I will try my best to bring what I'm doing back on to this screen I'm recording on when you need to see what I'm doing but I need to keep my screen free here so we can see what's happening so now that I've got my rim in place I want to see a bit more of a highlight of what's going on with the um, top of the head I'm going to add a camera and then um, that camera is going to be placed a uh, based upon where my position is right now so I can then just back off a little bit and then start to make any adjustments I'm going to see what I can do with this rim making this a little bit bigger and um, what I'm looking to do is is to capture not just the, the side of the face and the shoulders but I want to capture a little bit of the head as well just around the edges there and um, the bigger the light that you create the more uh, intense that light's going to be so you may need to um, bring down that multiplier setting in there so something like that is fine you can, you can have a little bit of hotness on that um, reflection but that's fine as long as it's not too um, too much on there now I'm going to disable the rim light and put the key light on and because the key light is made up of a very small light we need to ramp up that intensity so that's exactly what I'm going to do in fact I'm going to just type in 400 and see where we go from there Okay, so that's that's something more what we're after here you combine that with a rim and this is something like what you should get you can see here that the shadow underneath the nose it's got this nice hard shadow there you can make it softer by making the light bigger and then bring it down its intensity but I'm going to stick with this for the moment because it does help me set up the subsurface scattering the next thing is is if you haven't already got your bump map or your displacement map you want to plug this in um, and any other map that controls specular reflectivity, you're going to plug this in right now. It's also um, nice sometimes to have um, global illumination turned on, uh, which can act as a fill light, or you can add another area light if you want. I'm going to stick with just these lights for the moment in either case. So the next thing is, is we want to, we've got all the bump information that we need on there. We just need to add a little bit more detail if we've got the maps for them so the bump maps plugged in and working you note that the model may have changed this is just because I've actually had to change the model because of the UVs it wasn't on the last model that I had but it's the same principle and setup um, and exactly the same material is been applied to it once you've got the bump set on there then you'll be in a good position then to start to evaluate um, how reflection should be looking with your lighting so this is only a real basic default kind of setup for reflection but you would want to have some texture maps to control roughness um, and a specular amount as well now you'll find that you can't necessarily just grab some pre-made textures from that was developed for another app like Modo and expect them to work straight away inside Cinema 4D's render engines or ones that are available for it. This is because there is a different kind of setup and parameter for each individual render engine that you use and sometimes they use maps, grayscale maps in the opposite direction like for instance a white area would be um, a high amount of reflection you make it the opposite happening where it's the, the darker area which is reflection on another renderer so just bear in mind with that so we've got this set of maps here and I'm gonna see this roughness here this one is what I'm going to be using along with let's have a look you've got the bump in there I'm just going to add the the spec roughness this is using the reflection so we will plug it all in see how it goes 
if it doesn't look too great, then I'm not going to be too concerned with it um, being Redshift's fault. Because simply put, it could be that the maps are just not really ideal for this particular re render engine. So we will see. Let's drag and drop our roughness into here. And then we will connect that under the reflection. See this free in there. And there it is, roughness. So that's helped right away. We've got the roughness set up. You can see there's a little bit more shine on the nose there. And it's much more flatter of a reflection elsewhere. And this is how it should be. There's more oil on the skin of the nose. So that really does help have these things set up. You'll find when it comes to setting these things up that you need everything to be set up right. One thing can throw it off. Um, so that definitely helps. Now I'm going to try the reflection map in here as well to see how we get on with that. This is going to be controlling the amount. Yeah, it's right at the bottom there. So you can see here, this is one of those such cases where it may be the wrong way around where you would need to have the map um, flipped with its grayscale values. I'm quite happy with what we've got here for our starting, so I'm going to just scrap that. The idea of this process is that we've got a bit of lighting in there. We've got something going on where we can set up the lighting with the reflection and the bump and the displacement, etc. You don't really want to move on until you've at least set those things up. Um, the next thing is is um, we want to add um, the color. Now you could in this particular case go for our multi SSS and what we would tend to do is we would drag the color map which is to show you again this is our color map here Keep dragging the wrong one over. Um, and we will plug this into the diffuse color. This gives us the initial color base down. We would also use the same map. Um, sometimes it depends on the render engine. In the multi scattering settings, so we, we could plug that into here. But the three that we would want in here would be a quite vivid color in here. This could be either a plain vivid red. And then you would go for something a little bit more subtle in here. This would be more of a kind of a pinky to yellow tone. And in the bottom here, you would probably had something a bit like blue. Now I'm used to this kind of setup when it comes to um, V-Ray. So that's kind of what I tend to do. Another way that you could work this is just to use a couple of them. So we're going to turn these on. Now just because we turn these on doesn't mean you're going to see anything because we haven't actually added any amount onto there at the moment. So what I normally do is before I start chucking in maps, I get a generalized idea of the amount by just pure color. So what, what I do for here is I will select a red and then I wouldn't go too vivid on the red because it can cause a lot of noise. So I'll go for something probably like this. And then I will copy this value into here and I'll go for just a little bit deeper tone. And then in here I will go for a, a pale blue. The radius, I tend to go for something like about four for this and then I go lower as I go down. So I'll go for like a radius of four Run about there, and then the next one here I'll go for about two or three, and then this one radius of one is absolutely fine where it is. The amount will be set to 100%, but your radius scale at 100 is bang on wrong. So the first port of call that I would do is literally go half of this, and then see where we stand with it. 
And you can see here we've got a little bit of scattering in the back of the year there. And um, you can see here that we've got a little bit of pink just showing on the outside of our um, shadow. This is what we're looking for. This is a really good start. Now this, you don't want to overdo the subsurface scattering, especially with using subsurface scattering for um, either point based or redshift in general. Redshift hasn't got as good feedback for subsurface scattering. Probably not the right word for, for it, but it hasn't quite got the subtlety and shadow depth as the subsurface scattering as you'll find in random walk or AL surface material um, for V-Ray. What tends to happen is, is you got a similar effect, but it's not quite there. And you'll notice this with creases and with thinner areas like around the eyes that you'll tend to get bleeding. Bleeding is when you've got a very bright and luminous almost glow of red coming through where it shouldn't be there it should be more of a darker toned shadow with a little bit of red there and this is where it differs from V-Ray to going to something like um, Redshift V-Ray AL Service Shader or Random Walk will tend to produce much more realistic results off the bat and you'll get no bleeding in between the lips the nose or where you've got creases and you probably wouldn't notice it at the moment until you dialed it up a little bit heavier there on the radius scale. So if you take it up a little bit further there, you'll, you'll start to get a little bit more scatter on the years. But you'll also find that you'll get a bit of bleeding that comes along with it. But you don't need to go crazy with subsurface scattering anyway. Another thing to mention is, is when it comes to the diffuse colour, you want to make sure that your map in the general settings is definitely set up right for the gamma so if you enable this gamma override it should be set to srgb when it comes to a map which is um, got that included in the, the the profile of that particular file so we're talking about compressed images like jpeg png uh, etc but when it comes to 32-bit float, 16-bit images that are TIFF, PSDs, um, then you would typically expect to see a gamma of 1, and you typically use those files for displacement maps, um, TIFF um, sort of files like 32-bit and 16-bit files, but JPEG and that will be have a profile needed for sRGB in it. If it didn't automatically pick it up, that is. Now, as you can see there, it looks like very pale skin, but it's it's kind of like a a, a look of Redshift. What I found with Redshift subsurface scattering is you don't tend to get a deep, dark subsurface scattering effect when it comes to like the reds. They tend to be either very faint, and if you push them too hard, then what you'll tend to get in instead of that would be a lot of noise and a lot of bleeding just because you felt you've had to ramp it up to get the desired effect but um, don't get me wrong I've seen way worse subsurface scattering than this but this certainly isn't up the league of a random walk or AL service um, not even close I must say although some may argue and say it's close but it depends who that is and how observant you are with detail So what I tend to find is, is if you take this layer, for instance, and you ramp this up to have a really vivid red, you tend to get a lot of bleeding coming through and you will tend to get um, a lot of noise coming from this. So I wouldn't advise you to go too vibrant with these colors. So I'm going to just plug in these maps here and these maps are going to be better than just picking a color um, because we've got different colors that are going to be brought through say for instance the ears and the lips where you're going to see more subsurface scattering we've also got a subsurface scattering amount which is going to basically control the amount that we've got set up for here overall that is 
the overall amount of where it's applied. So we'll plug these in and see how we go. So I'm going to now put this one in here. This is got a more pinky tone. This would go um, for what we've got here to replace the red channel. Now the red channel, the darker red or the lighter red, shall I say, the primary one that comes through here is our layer one. So we will plug this into our layer one in our material. Layer one color. You can see by adding that layer one color that we've lost a little bit of the red tint due to the fact that the color itself isn't that all that saturated. It does work in other programs. I mean, it works extraordinarily well inside Modo, get very realistic results. So what we could do is we could go to add something like um, a color correction. And we can put that between the map. So what I'll do is I'll plug that into the layer one and then plug the texture into a color correct. So it goes in between. This then gives me the opportunity to ramp up the saturation. And then we can start to get some of those colors back again. Unfortunately, what we don't have with this is we don't have a preview here like we do inside V-Ray. And the preview just simply just gives us literally this render here um, and it will just update to show you what's happening with the nodes. Well, not nodes inside V-Ray that I've been using, but the material. So that when I would change that saturation, I would see here that change just to that particular node or material area that I'm working on. You just don't get this inside uh, Redshift. So you kind of don't, in the V-Ray version I was using inside Cinema 4D, you don't have a good IPR like you do inside Redshift, but you do at least see what adjustments you're making rather than you, you're doing this adjustment and you don't really know how much saturation you're adding because your feedback needs to be on the material you're adjusting or the texture that you're adjusting. And um, unfortunately, I don't get that. Even if you was to solo it or anything like that, that's the only real way that you could get that kind of feedback. But I'll prefer to have it inside here with the render preview here so I can see what's going on with the actual render itself at the same time as seeing what I'm doing to the texture. But... Um, it's not a, a bad trade-off. You can still at least solo it and, and get to see what it's contributing. You can see how important detail is for these things. Because detail will tend to be lost. You can also see how much samples would be needed to get rid of this. And sometimes you have to take these samples up pretty damn high. So I will jump straight to 1024. You don't want to overdo the subsurface scattering. That's probably as far as I would take it. Um, but then what you can do after this point is you could, if you wanted to, make that light a little bit more softer. Now we've established um, the shadows have got the red tint on the outside there. The next thing is I'm going to create some materials for the eyes. Well, some materials for the eyes, yeah. I'm going to correct one which is going to be the lens and we're just going to duplicate that this one's going to be the iris I will deal with the lens first for the lens we just can use a preset from the basics property we can use glass And then that gives us a starting point anyway. And 
leaves, that's the one. Okay, and then the iris is going to be applied to the eyeball. Got an eye material here. So I'll diffuse colour. We don't need any reflectivity on that at all. I would put a reflectivity if I had a bump for the eye or the iris, but we don't have one of them, so not entirely needed. Um, I would also possibly add a little bit of subsurface scattering. little tinge of blue or pink clearly the lens isn't doing too much at this particular angle. This is possibly down to the fact that the roughness is set to zero. We need to turn this up a little bit. So we'll go to our lens. See here our roughness is zero. We'll turn this up a little bit, you'll start to see a little bit of specularity showing up. There we go. You can also adjust the inject refraction. The higher the level, the more to the front that we're going to see more reflection and the lower the more to the back we're going to see reflection you can see it looks a bit odd now for displacements to work you first of all need to make sure that on your main object you right click and you go to your redshift tags and add the redshift object you will immediately go to geometry override Enable tessellation and enable displacement. If you don't do this, you will not see any displacement. Now, it just so happens this model was a high resolution model, so that you may not see the results the same as what you would expect to see, but I'm going to show you this workflow anyway. I've got four displacement mats for different sub D levels, and my sub D level for this person is quite high. So I'm going to go for one of these two end ones here. Copy that one there, I think. I'm going to drag and drop that into there. Once it's loaded, I'm then going to add a displacement node. And plug my texture into that. Texture, map. Before we plug this into our main service node, we need to make sure that we do some changes here. Now, we're dealing with a 16-bit displacement map here, so we need to make sure that we change these values. So the new range minimum would be minus 0.5. This is a good starting point. And the max range is 0.5. This is taking into account a 0.5 range for a grayscale value map. Then what we do is we need to make sure that if it's a TIFF file, which it is, that we enable override and make sure that the gamma's set to 1. Uh, this makes sure that 
um, sometimes you'll get this where the TIFF doesn't pick up correctly and it applies um, an sRGB value and it should be 1. And then finally we will output this into a displacement on the... Um, if I just expand this a little bit here. See the output here, the main output, we plug our displacement into there. As you can see the displacement is quite heavy. We go into our displacement material and we can bring the scale down here. Try 0.5, that brings it down a little bit. Also we can head to our tag that we put on the head and there's a couple of things that we can take note of. For the really high details, if they're not showing through enough, um, you adjust the minimum edge length. But before you do that, you've got to make sure that you're not being tricked to what this is doing because by default you've got this auto bump mapping turned on. If you turn this off, you will find that a lot of your detail will instantly go and then it leaves it up to the setting which you can more visibly set up now for here. If I'm going to go to extreme value of say 1, you should see more of that detail come through. But sometimes the extra time that it takes to render isn't worth that extra effort. So you can enable the auto bump if you find them that's doing just as a good job. In many cases it actually is and it speeds things up significantly. So I could put this up to 3 quite happily and then re-enable this bump mapping and then it will push that through. If it's still too heavy you can still adjust that scale down. So we've got the scale in here. I'll leave the scale to the maximum in here but we adjust it in here. Again you would typically apply this to a model which has got no surface detail on there and this model already did so you're seeing kind of an override really of too much detail coming through. I'll try the the, the other map that I was going to plug and this is the kind of one for a much higher level model which retains a lot of its detail already. So this has less mid-range displacement and it probably is more suitable for this We've just got more of the high, higher frequency details coming through. Next we're going to go and try to add a HDR. So for that we go to the redshift with lights and we add a dome light. I'm going to go into my settings for the redshift and I'm going to go to GI. I'm going to turn this on for brute force. And the secondary engine, I'm going to choose Irradiant Point Cloud. Now you can set this up to work alone or with the lights that we've already added. I'm going to first set it up to work alone. So at the moment we've got no texture map in here. I'm going to drag and drop a HDR image into the path. And now when we add that, we're going to get some proper shadow in where they should be. This is ideal for if you want to purely light up based upon this type of lighting, HDR lighting. You can also increase that exposure. But I'll often like to have a little bit of my own lighting with HDR, so this becomes more of a feel light. And I'll add the rim, then add my key, and then you're going to get a little bit more balance between the whole lot. It looks a little bit more realistic. Backing out of the camera. We 
set myself up a little basic studio for this. And now what you see is you've got a bit more balance with the subsurface scattering, the shadows, and with the uh, HDR that's acting as a fill light. While at the same time we've still got our rim and our key doing most of the bulk of the work. Just as a comparison, I just wanted you to see what the same model looks like when it's set up inside Modo. This of course is using all of the maps that were provided with this particular scene. But as you can see here, there is definitely a much more realistic look within Modo setup. I had applied exactly the same maps inside Redshift, but Redshift didn't really quite respond the same and as I probably already mentioned in this video tutorial you can't always expect to use maps that are de developed specifically for another render engine and expect to get the same results you do have to kind of tweak maps um, to get the kind of similar results I did in fact actually try at a separate time to make my own maps for this particular project but I never got the same results as I've got in V-Ray AL service um, or Modo 902 which is what it's rendering in now so this will be the conclusion of this tutorial and I just wanted to wrap up with showing you what happens when you've spent a little bit more time to create some maps that are kind of more geared towards the render engine that you're using. If you're using a different render engine and you've made maps for that render engine you can't expect to just plug them straight into a different render engine such as Redshift because each and every render engine will require its own little tweaks and its own little ways to get certain results. This is why I've showed you before what it's like just to try to use maps that are maybe supplied with your model or that you've made for another render engine and then I've gone ahead and made some adaptions so this is what this video is about to show you what adaptions that I've made to get the results that I've got right now so let's take a closer look and see what I've actually had to do here so we'll just start from the top and we're going to maximise this so we can see what's going on. So we've got the roughness map and originally I used the roughness map that came with the, um, the model but I had to go in and create my own and even then the roughness map isn't really as complete as I would like to have it but it will it will do for this purpose. Now what I like to do with roughness maps when I've done them inside ZBrush is to run them into Photoshop and do a little bit of clean up and blur them slightly. With the one that I've got here it's not blurred so you can see here that we've got quite a harsh change between one tone and another. So what I would typically do is run this through Photoshop and then clean it up a bit and just blur it out a little bit so that it can transition between one value and another a little bit better but even then it, it did um, seem to work quite well in the case of redshift what will happen is is the darker the color the more shiny reflective the roughness becomes so in other words if you used a map that was black your model would look something resembling a snooker ball that'd be like or like a piece of glass that's all buffed up and shiny so you can see here that the the lips the intention was oh, obviously I didn't paint this on a 2d map I painted it directly onto the model so it looks a little bit more rougher but 
The intention is, is to have the darkness more on the inside of the lips where it be more wet and have it going out to be a little bit lighter in some places um, towards the outer part of the lips. You can see also the nose has got a little bit more of a darker area and right on the inside where we've got this is one piece of geometry the the tear ducts are actually really dark because I wanted the reflectivity to be quite high because it's quite watery there. In general the more places where there's going to be oil is the darker they're going to be and the less places where they're going to be oily or wet is going to be lighter and that's why the map is created the way it is. You can see here we've even got a little bit of extra um, darkness on the forehead where it would be a little bit more oily. And when it comes down to the subsurface scattering if you want more control you can certainly have that control which, which is a really good thing. So generally when you go into the material and you go to your multi SSS you've got the options to use what's there. You can select a color and you can select the amount um, between 0 and 1 and obviously you can set the radius but if you want a little bit more control what you can do is you can go in there and create maps or even use um, some of the other nodes that are available to you. So in this particular case you can see on layer 1 from my subsurface scattering I've got a node plugged into the colour and the weight and what it was is I wanted to have a combination between a solid colour, the colour that I used initially and have it mixed between that and a hand painted map to put a little bit more detail behind the skin tone. So this is what this is all about. So we've got this absolute colour node and this is the colour I chose for the absolute colour. And this is plugged into a colour mixer. What this basically allows you to do is it allows you to mix um, multiple maps or multiple colours to output as one. Obviously it's going to be mixed how you like it. So I'm just going to put it like this so we can see this. So what we've got here is we've got a texture map that I hand painted. And you can see here it's got a lot of veiny like textures to the surface of it um, but it needed needed to be much more dense um, not dense but more saturated so this is why I run it through this color correct and for the color correct I give it a more contrast and I give it more saturation scale and by putting on this little tiny button here this solo what it will do is it will solo this and then it will show you in the render view the IPR what it looks like. So this is the outcome of that particular map as you can see it's quite dense in its saturation. So the next thing was to combine this with the absolute colour that I wanted along with the texture map and of course I did this by plugging this into a mix, a colour mix. So by default the input one is going to be 100% which is the the, uh, the output colour, an absolute colour and then what I did is I mixed in this texture which has been colour corrected into input 2 and the result is this. So you'll be able to see that, I'll just put this to the side, I'm going to solo this colour mix and what you'll see now is you'll see we've got this absolute colour completely filling it but you've also got this texture being mixed in with it as well and this is done by using this color mix and this is plugged in to my SSS layer color one and next we're going to look at this SSS amount um, I'm used to calling it subsurface scattering amount from other render engines but the fact is, is it's the weight so this is plugged into two I to choose um, two layers so it's going to control the layer of weight 1 and weight 2. And if we just look at this map quickly, you'll see here that the whiter the areas, the more subsurface scattering we're going to have, and the darker the areas, the less subsurface scattering. You see here I attempted to put a darker color on the inside of the lips 
and on the creases above the eyes. This is because the subsurface scattering, whether it be ray trace or point base, it makes no difference. Inside redshift, it will tend to bleed in those particular areas. And this is the way that you can kind of control it by applying less subsurface scattering in these particular areas. And again, this is a roughly um, painted map inside ZBrush, but it does the job. So I'm controlling two layers. I've got another subsurface amount. This one is identical to the last one, but it's not quite as hard on the ears here. So it's not quite as bright on the ears as the other one. And this is plugged in to the weight of layer two. So you can see here how I've managed to control the weight and the color of the subsurface scattering. So now coming down to here, we've got a bump map. So we've got a texture map plugged into a bump. If you go into here and you type in bump, you'll see it come up, the bump map. And you've got a bump blender, just like when you're using displacement map, you've got a displacement and a displacement blender. And it does have what you would imagine. It enables you to blend multiple bump maps or multiple displacement maps to output as one. And this is really, really handy when you've got multiple levels of detail. And um, I used another project recently for, um, on a fish, on a carp to be exact, where I had multiple levels of detail and I wanted to combine them and then mix them in myself within Redshift using uh, a blender node. One for um, displacement blending that was, and of course you got it for their bump as well. Although I've not tried the bump blending yet, but displacement I have. And then finally down here we've got the the texture, and this this was something that I did myself. I went back into ZBrush, added some extra details, so that I could get a little bit more detail which wasn't there. So for instance, um, there wasn't much detail on the lips, and I wanted a little bit more detail in the face in general. So. That's what that map's all about in the displacement. As I explained earlier, the displacement, it's a 16-bit displacement, it's grayscale. So it's got a minimum range of minus 0.5, a maximum of 0.5, and then the scale is adjusted here. Of course, you do have to have your um, tag on your object for it to work. I'm just gonna take this solo button off you do have to have the um, the tag on your object so that you're able to go in there and turn on override have your tessellation which this replaces your normal what you would normally use your sub the sur subdivision surface tag you don't need to use that when you're using redshift you can use this instead and it will um, subdivide it on at render time so that's definitely something you can do there and you see here i've got maximum subdivisions i probably don't even need that amount to be quite honest with you because the mesh is quite high so it really doesn't need it as many subdivisions as that so depending on what you want to do or the output you're going to get is um as to the quality if you're using this um, option enable auto bump mapping you don't need to have this minimum edge length too low in fact you're going to save yourself a lot of time if you have it um, at default if you can get away with that and I found often I can get away with that but it will save you a bit of time by, by putting those settings in so that's really it um, so there's the results for that I haven't got the dome light turned on but if you turn that on you can see here that it's mixed to be part of the rim and the key so I've got a little bit more of an overall um, feel like you could say to fill it all in
What I generally find with um, rendering inside Redshift is I often have to go in and apply a little bit of post into there, which is to be quite honest with you, what you're going to do inside Photoshop anyway. Um, but uh, I just generally just jump straight to the the uh, the contrast. That's a, probably the first thing I will jump to to get it in there. Um, another thing to mention is is um, right now I am using this setting in Redshift in the system I'll just show you here, and it's automatic sampling. It does an absolute fantastic job. It really is good if you haven't got the time to manually tweak um, the quality for your sampling and you just want to start to work on your model like I've been doing and then what you can do from there is you can then go back and then do some manual setups for your final if you wanted to but I found in general so far it's been really good and um, the render times have been quite acceptable. The render that you see in the background here only took um, 2 minutes 25 seconds um, with an R RTX 2080 tie. So not bad at all. Um, as I mentioned before, with Redshift in general, you do need to try to control this bleeding that goes on, increases uh, around the eyes and in between the lips. You can see this is quite evident, especially as soon as you start adding a little bit of um, contrast because that also increases the, um, the saturation as well but this is something that you don't get with L surface and apparently you don't get it with random walk I haven't got to use random walk yet so this render is with global illumination and a HDR applied and this is the same render but without global illumination turned on <laughs> 